And so they come up with so many ideas. And I think if we can give that to our kids, but also to ourselves, because as parents, we sometimes think we have to be perfect and we have to do it this way and that way, and especially not this way, but especially that way. It's, there is so much going on. But if we could ask ourselves, hmm, I wonder what it would look like. Welcome to Planning to Garden. I'm Ed Chandler. So in today's episode, I'll be sharing with you a conversation that I had recently with Monique Seabreeks of Great Parents in Power. Monique is a personal leadership and parenting coach, and our conversation broadly focuses on who we want to be and how we create an environment that supports the experiences that we want to create for ourselves and to share with those around us. This aligns well with our goals of becoming creators of our own gardens. In this conversation, Monique will also be talking about a tool that she's developed for how to have daily, meaningful, engaging conversations with our kids. So without further ado, let's dive in. (laughs) Welcome to the Planning to Garden podcast, Monique. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to talk to you. So I wanted to start off the year talking with you uh, because you have developed a number of programs, uh, including Great Parents in Power, and that really helps people find that sort of leadership within themselves to be a better parent and to create the relationship that they want with their family. Uh, And part of that goes to the environment that we create for our family and for our kids. And part of it also deals with the mindset with which we approach creating and manifesting that environment and that relationship and how we, we approach our conversations and, and interactions. So all of that is, is this creative process. And that's why I wanted to reach out to you as we look to starting out this new year and really setting our intentions for what we want to create as we move forward. I love that. And, and, and you are so right. I think that being a parent really, if we allow ourselves to go there, it really puts us in the creative mindset because what do we want and how do we, who do we want to be and how do we want to show up and what kind of home do we want to create? And it doesn't matter if our home is really small or really big and what kind of outdoor space do we, if we have it, do we uh, want to create or do we want to take our kids to? I realize that there are many people who have a, a maybe a, a little bit of a garden and go to the park a lot, but uh, even that little bit of space can help to really nurture the relationship that we want to have with our children and within our family. I think being a parent really invites us, and hopefully there is an us in a relationship with another co-parent, it really invites us to create what, what it is that we are looking for. You know, one of the things that I, I talk with people about is this idea that a way to approach creating a space is to start by thinking about the experiences that we want to create. And sketching that out or writing that out on a piece of paper even to say, okay, let's imagine an interaction. Let's imagine, you know, an afternoon tea time at a little table out in the garden. Any sort of uh, interaction, you can run through these different permutations of saying, you know, what, it, what would this interaction look like in an ideal sense? And then what pieces need to be in that environment to support that type of interaction? Because ultimately, the interaction itself and that positive experience is what we really want. You know, the garden is the garden is very nice, but it's the experiences that it enables that really make it powerful. And I agree with you. It is almost as if we want to create the future that we want to pull the future towards us instead of repeating the past, instead of saying how the past has been and and kind of on. Un- in automatic mode, recreate that same thing. I Um, love that idea of pulling the future forward, taking uh, that idealized future and pulling it toward you. Yes. And I agree with you that um, for me, and I have raised children my own, and I've been part of a community and I've volunteered a lot at schools where gardens were important. Um, to me, it's really important that the garden has a space for, for me where I can sit and where I can feel 
uh, nurtured and where I can listen because especially in a family where there's always chaos, it's important that I have a space where I can connect with me, where I can hear myself think and feel. Yeah, I think a lot of people can identify with that feeling if they have little kids. And also, um, depending on the children's age, what do we want for them? Because some kids love digging and so it's ridiculous to create a beautiful garden and not have them have their experience in the mud. Because I remember my daughter's favorite experiences were when we were stomping in the rain in the mud and the grass didn't look like anything, I, you know, it looked like terrible afterwards, but that was what she loved and did. So our young I, kids definitely go for that experience. You know, when it starts raining, they look outside, they start looking for where the puddles are forming so that they can put on their wet gear and go out and stomp around in the puddles. Yeah. Yeah. So I love that you are doing your program because we can create different sections in the garden that nurtures us, nurtures our children. And then I love this idea of having tea together and where can we come together and where can we, you know, hang. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and you've also raised a really interesting and important point as we, we think about the program of spaces that we develop uh, in our gardens, creating a space where you can really connect with yourself and you, uh, to your point, where you can hear yourself think and, and really, you know, focus in your energy. That's what one of the things that gardens do really well is give us a way to let our, our stress reduce. And so including that sort of space where you can recharge for a moment and, and really reset your energy so that you can be your best self. I mean, you've talked a lot about how focusing on your own thoughts and energy helps you parent more effectively. And can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, in a nutshell, it is, again, pulling the future towards you because who would you ideally like to be or who, what kind of parent would you have liked to have had growing up? And what is the most ideal parent that you would like your kid to have or that they need to have? And it sounds like really, really um, stressful to think about that or really um, um, it, that it is about perfection, but it's not, it's a creative process. Because as our children go, we, we grow. And as they develop, we develop. So it's a mutual going in and out and mo moving forward, backwards, uh, resetting, resetting. So it's kind of like this endless uh, flow. But I think as parents, we need to have some foundation. And that is what I do in my work. I create the foundation, which I think if you parent with another person, uh, you need to both understand the foundation. And from there, you can go anywhere. So let's talk about building that foundation. What are the key elements of building that foundation? That's a, an element that I've talked about with garden design is this idea that there are some, there are a lot of different ways to approach a garden. I mean, people are interested in permaculture. They're interested in native plants. They're interested in, you know, English gardens. They're interested in dwell ultramodernism. All of these are stylistic and sort of programmatic choices, but they all come back to this base foundation of what is essential in understanding and, and creating a garden. Yeah, I think that you need to know who you are. Hmm. And so, and I think that you need to know where you come from. I think you need to not know just who your parents were. I think you need to understand the generations before your parents. Because mm. most of our parents kind of repeated what their parents uh, did. And then you need to understand the culture that they grew up in, that you grow up in. And then you need to be very clear about what it is that you like in the culture and what you don't like in the culture. And then you kind of have a basic understanding of who you are. And then you create an English garden or, or, or a permaculture. Mm -hmm. But that also informs you about who you can be as a parent. Mm -hmm. That reminds me a bit about uh, some of the things Brene Brown has talked about in, in her talks, where she, she talks about the influences of her Germanic uh, family lineage, and then you know, bringing that set of ideas and, and that ethos, and then coming to Texas, and how that 
overlaid over the top and how that really drove a lot of her early thinking. And she had to uh, engage with that and, and be able to sort of stand apart from it for a moment and recognize where that was creating impulse responses that she didn't necessarily want to choose. And so she had to reprogram how she responded in some situations. Yeah. In my work, the part of the foundation is to understand who you would like to be. And that is kind of loosely, as a parent, loosely where you want to go. Mm -hmm. But then there are all, this ob all these obstacles. So just like what you just were talking about, you have to understand how your beliefs and how your um, perceptions and how your expectations and, I mean, all those things, how they can mess up what you want and who your children need you to be. They can also mess up your garden. Because if you have an English garden and you haven't thought about it, <laughs> it's a lot of work. And your kids can mess it up or the dog can mess it up. I mean, for people who have dogs, I mean, my dogs have destroyed my gardens many times. But sure. anyway, so you have the vision, you have the obstacles, and then you know, to, need to know how to continuously nurture yourself so that you can um, withstand all the chaos and uh, all the things that are not happening that you thought they were going to happen and were going to be easier. And then there are all the challenges in society that come at you and from the school that come at you and you're wondering if you're doing it right. So I hope that answers your question. I think it does really getting to that. So if I'm, if I'm understanding, it's getting that historical background and then understanding the vision of where you want to go and then how to nurture yourself. Did I get that right? Yes. Okay, very good. And, the, and that idea of being able to nurture oneself is, is so important, both you know, in the garden, but also just in your, in your life in general. And this is where I, if I remember, and I try to remember, and thank God I have a dog who reminds me, I try to go outside. Oh, there you go. Mm -hmm. Because it is the sky, is, you know, the sky can be so big. And mm -hmm. then there is maybe a moon and then there are the trees. And then I really try to soak up nature because I do think that we are not separate from nature. We are mm -hmm. connected. And, you know, there are more and more books about how trees communicate with each other. And, and there's so much about nature that we don't understand. But as an example... They are now thinking about healing hospitals in, for example, Japan and Denmark, because they realize how much more healing happens, you know, when you have a disease or you need to recover from something that was wrong in your body. Nature has an enormous um, influence on us. So mm -hmm. that's how I also look at nature on my dog walks. There you go. Well, and right now you're in this wonderful setting. You have these great trees behind you and it, it just looks like the kind of place I just want to jump through the camera and come take a walk with you. Looks beautiful there. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, uh, this is, this is not part of, uh, of, of garden design, but if people have the, the opportunity to take kids on a backpacking trip, mm -hmm. that's where you really are in nature all the time and then you come home and you realize how powerful it is to be mm -hmm. in nature and then you can do something in your garden to strengthen what you have gained exactly so these experiences that we go out into the world whether we're hiking or whether we're traveling to another country or some some interesting place one of the ways that we can continue to connect to that is to take references from those spaces, either materials or, or symbols or types of plants if they grow where we live um, and be able to bring those into the garden so that it's a, it's a touchstone or a connection to those experiences that we had somewhere else that were immersive and, and really uh, energetically wonderful. You know, when you're traveling, you, you have this, this sense of, of going somewhere and feeling like everything is just, all the colors are rich and the smells are, are really poignant. And, um, you know, you remember the experiences. I mean, you feel like you're deeply set in those experiences. And then you come home and everything is sort of a little bit bland. And it, part of that just comes from 
the familiarity of your normal surroundings. And so that unfamiliarity with these other places really opens up your senses to that space. But if you can bring some elements of that home, then you have this quick touchstone to be able to bring yourself back to that more colorful experience that you had of going somewhere else. Yeah, and thank you for saying that because I think that um, sometimes parents think about schooling in, you know, going to school and doing the homework and the math sheets. But what I have seen in raising our kid and what I see in my neighborhood and actually have neighbors right now, these kids are in the ground all the time and they find all these bugs and all these things that, and they wonder how they live and they put them in a terrarium and then it works or it doesn't work and then they add grass and things like that. But I, I see that that is uh, also part of their schooling because they learn about bugs, they're wondering, they're curious, curious, curious. I cannot uh, o- overstate that enough. And they, um, they, they learn their math and their languages. Now they know this word terrarium and, and they are busy all the time because they are so in the garden. Well, and you've talked about the, uh, the your your daughter went through Waldorf education, and you've talked about how wonderful that experience was. Um, and part of that I've learned is creating the curiosity first, and letting the information follow the curiosity. Yes, as a as an overall ethos of how they approach education. So, as as we've had, our kids have, have started to grow up and be old enough to engage in education, we've connected with a Waldorf school uh, here locally, and that's just been a wonderful experience to to watch that process of of discovery curiosity and then and bringing the learning on and they just soak it up. I mean, it's, it's amazing to see how much information that they soak up once they're engaged in discovery of whatever the thing is. Yeah. And um, curiosity, I think is a main word. One of the things that I see with parents is that So this child is born and then suddenly they have this avalanche of thoughts that they have to put as much information in the child because, oh my, it needs to survive in this world. It needs to thrive. And we have to put all this information in. Mm -hmm. And so they, they are basically stifling this kid with too much information, Mm -hmm. whereas the Waldorf school and there are more uh, kinds of education that do this. They say, after a child asks a question, they say, hmm, I wonder, how would that be? So my neighbor kids, for example, they wonder how this uh, little bug that they just found, how it lives. And then the answer is, hmm, I wonder. And now they are going to search and they're going to see if there are other bugs. And maybe they live in the ground and they start to, you know. And so they come up with so many ideas. And I think if we can give that to our kids, but also to ourselves, because as parents, we sometimes think we have to be perfect and we have to do it this way and that way, and especially not this way, but especially that way. And we're trying to perform in the eyes of others. And we don't want to have mommy guilt and we don't want to have, you know, and dads, are sh- dads have to show up in, in this way and moms have to show. It's, there is so much going on. But if we could ask ourselves, hmm, I wonder what it would look like. Well, that's a a powerful concept, this idea that you don't, when they ask a question, our, I think our impulse from sort of traditional schooling is to provide the answer. They ask a question, you provide an answer. And then sometimes the impulse is uh, they ask a small question, almost as though, hey, could I have a slice of apple? And you give them a bushel and they're going, ah, too much, way too much. And so then they, they wander off and we go, oh, well, I guess they weren't that interested, but we just overwhelmed them. So what it sounds like you're suggesting is when they ask that question, energetically reinforcing that, that sense of, of questioning and discovery and allowing them to further pursue that question on their own and see what they come up with. Yes. And one of the things that we have developed in, in our family and you know everything about it, and I can gift it to your listeners, are the three questions that we ask at dinner, because I think dinner is a wonderful way to come together. And uh, the three questions to this day really make our dinners amazing. I mean, we did it last night and we're sitting at the table with two 24 year olds. 
and they soak it up. They love it. And from these questions come elaborations and ideas and questions and more, you know, and you get to know the other person. It's amazing how it has always enriched our dinners. Okay. That'll be wonderful. I'm, I look forward to sharing that with everyone. Yeah, I'll give you the link and then they can, uh, they can enjoy it. And then if people want to get in touch with me about why it is so beautiful or wonderful, then mm-hmm. please, by all means, but I'll send, I'll send you the link to a booklet. Wonderful. Okay. That sounds like a great idea. Munich, I really appreciate your time today and your, your input as we look to create a better year for this next year. Uh, how can people best find you? So the website is called greatparentsempower.com. And my name is Monique, and it's spelled in a different way. So uh, I think you will uh, give people the link to my email, mm-hmm. Monique yeah. at greatparentsempower.com. And um, my Say that again, Monique mm-hmm. at greatparentsempower.com. Great. And we'll put that in the show notes so that people have that information available to them. Thank you so much. And um, I am very focused this year on helping couples to okay. create the best environment for their children. So it was a real pleasure talking to you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. That was a really fun conversation. Best wishes. You too. Bye. Sarah, bye. So there we go. Some ideas to get us started toward who we want to become and the experiences that we want to create over the coming year. So tell me in the comments, what experiences do you want to create for yourself and to share with your family over the coming year? They could be experiences in the garden or traveling or backpacking, or simply the conversations that you have each night while sitting around the dinner table with your family. But let me know what you want to create this year. Make sure you check out the show notes to download the link to the three questions for you and your family. And while you're there, sign up for the Garden Creator Studio newsletter. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Planning to Garden. And to the creator within you, best wishes. I'll see you next time.